grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Our call to worship today is taken from Psalm 29 and 103. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Praise Yahweh, all you nations. Praise him, all you peoples of the world. His, his mercy, mercy toward us is powerful. Yahweh's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. Our first hymn today will be you angels bright who wait at God's right hand. and praise and thanksgiving to you uh, so indebted to you O Lord for calling us out of darkness for calling us out of our sins into the light of the blessed kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ to fellowship with you the living God and with your people we thank you father that you have ordained these holy uh, convocations of worship for your people that we might unite our hearts and minds together to adore you, to hear your word, to lift up our prayers and petitions before you. So, Father, be with us now by your precious, wonderful Holy Spirit to inspire our worship, to glorify yourself. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Our next hymn will be, To Him We Come. Jesus Christ our Lord.
in together. Come now to our call to confession of sin. We're the people of God, but Scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus intercedes for us with the Father, who freely forgives us through His infinite goodness and mercy. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. We'll take a few moments to confess our own sins privately to the Lord before we pray congregationally. Let's pray our unison prayer of confession. Holy, Holy Father, Father, you see, see us, us as, as we are and know our inmost thoughts. We confess that we are unworthy of your gracious care. We forget that all life comes from you, and that to you all life returns. We have not sought to do your will with our whole hearts. We have not lived as grateful children, nor loved as Christ loved us. Apart from you, we are nothing. Only your grace can sustain us, Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us, heal us, and make us whole. Set us free from our sins and restore us to the joy of your salvation now and forever. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Savior and Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's now confess our faith together in the words of the historic Apostles' Creed. As we join the church throughout the centuries and the church around the earth to confess our faith in the one God through His Son, Jesus. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come now to our scripture readings for this Lord's Day. They're all printed on the white sheet that you have. Psalm 107, verse 20 says, He sent out His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Amen. Let's turn to well, let's look on your sheet if you'd like. It's been given to you. Jeremiah 38, 1 through 13. Uh, Larry, will you please read this for us? Jeremiah 38, 1 through 13. Jeremiah 38, 1. Now Shephatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war, and live. Thus says the Lord, The city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and be taken. Then the officials said to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in this city, and the hands of all the people, by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of his people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down, 
by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. When Abed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern, and the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Abed Melech went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Then the king commanded Eben Melech, the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you from here, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Eben Melech took the man with him, the men with him, and went to the house of the king, to a wardrobe in the storehouse, and took from there old rags and worn out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. Then Eben Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. Amen. Amen. Let's now look at Psalm 69, verses 1 through 18. I'll read the first uh, the first six verses, and then all of us will read in unison the rest of the psalm that's printed here, 7 through 18. Psalm 69, 1 through 18. To the choir master, according to lilies of David. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire, where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without, it, without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal... Must I now restore? O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O oh Lord of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O oh God of Israel. For it for is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an, at an acceptable time, time O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O God, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me because of my enemies. Amen. I'm sorry. Yeah. A New Testament lesson. 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 14. Uh, Larry, would you read this for us? You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, 
The Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Amen. Amen. Now, our gospel lesson will be from Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. Wayne, would you read for us? A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. The Apostle Paul writes in Acts 20, verse 35, Everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's dedicate our offerings here with prayer. And I'll lead us today. Father, we thank you for the uh, opportunity we have to present offerings unto you, mm -hmm. something from the labor of our hands as we're able. We pray, Lord, you would use these offerings for the upbuilding of this local church and for the spread of the gospel throughout the earth. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that you have so ordained that we can participate in the growth of and sustenance of your kingdom through our offerings. In the name of Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our offering song will be Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart.
righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth, you are. At this time, we'll present our prayer request and our thanksgiving to pray together. Uh, I'll begin today. You all already know about Brother Willie Miles passing away last Thursday morning. Um, so he was one of the founders of our church, a uh, beloved brother and friend in the Lord, and we certainly treasured his fellowship for many years. And, uh, he, he died in his sleep, and uh, so we're thankful for him. Let's pray for the Lord's comfort to be with his family and, and friends today. Uh, Keith McFall in France uh, wrote us a card here we got this week. Thanked us for uh, some of the support that we send him from time to time. And what he's doing now, he and his wife Carmen, you remember them, uh, they are, they've moved from Paris to Nantes, which is in western France, and they have taken over a study center that they're wow. renting and it's going to be a, a, a bilingual study center French and English theological study for church people and pastors and so forth that are serving the Lord so this has been a great opportunity that was kind of opened up for them and so they're busy right now uh, preparing the buildings cleaning them and, and so forth uh, getting ready uh, for the opening of this study center. I'm not sure when it's going to open. But uh, anyway, so uh, he says here, um, we have this bilingual uh, community here in France that, we're, that they want to minister to, and the possibilities are before us. The work is ahead of us. And we're so grateful. You all that's us, have a share in the ministry here as well as back in Dallas. Praying for you all during this unusual time of the gospel. Uh, he says, it was good to see pictures of the church gathered for meals together. I trust that you're able to do this still despite precautions. So it's good to hear they're very good about keeping in touch personally. We appreciate that. Uh, okay, so also, Abraham Joseph, uh, you all know Abraham, he, he's he been ministering in Manila, Philippines for several years, a, a theological a seminary there, but he's had some, uh, some tests lately, uh, and so far so good, but he's got more tests for some, some problems, so let's pray that uh, the tests will come out well, and there won't, he won't have any serious problem that he'll, he'll have health and strength. Brother Abraham, Joseph. One more thing I have today. Almost every day, if I go out for an air and I pass Kingdom Hall here on Ferguson, the Jehovah's Witness building, it's been absolutely deserted. Absolutely deserted. I haven't seen a car there, I don't think, in months. So, I'd like for us to pray that specifically for these JWs, these Jehovah's Witnesses, that being at home, not being able to go to their own meetings, which are very structured, they'll watch things on the internet that'll bring them to the gospel, okay? Pray for the oh, amen. Jehovah's Witnesses today. All right, anything else to share together? Um, uh, our friend uh, uh, Andrew Prout, uh, wants us to pray for more rain in Washington. There's been some, but not okay. enough. And pray, we can pray for that whole our situation. Please. Okay. All right. We want to pray for, for health, mm -hmm. for healing, for those of us who have those kind of needs, Amen. look to the Lord, our healer, for his mercy. All right, 
Wayne, would you lead us in this prayer, please? And I'll take up anything that you, you didn't remember. Father, we are grateful to you for all of your blessings to us. And we do remember, Lord, with gratitude, our brother, Woody Miles. We thank you, Lord, for his life and for his testimony, for his faithful service to you many years in our congregation and then more years in another congregation. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, that you will be with his family to give them comfort as they bury him. This coming week. Sustain us, Lord, as we grieve those who go on before us. Yes, and because we miss them, and because we enjoy their fellowship, and we look forward, Lord, to the day when we shall once again see them in the resurrection of the dead. Amen. So give us all that hope as we grieve those who leave our midst. But we thank you, Lord, for those who labor for you overseas. We're giving. Thanks for Carmen and Keith McFall mm. and for their work in France. And we pray you'd bless this new enterprise yes, of this bilingual study center. That it will result in the strengthening of believers and result in the extension of the kingdom through conversion of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And Father, we do pray for our neighbors who are of another religious persuasion outside of the biblical Christ Jesus we yes, we pray for the Jehovah's Witnesses Lord that as they have maybe opportunities not to be in the structured meeting that they might uh, be exposed to other teachings yes, from the Christian faith that might challenge them where they are wrong and help them to see the greatness of Christ Jesus and come to embrace him in true and saving faith. Amen. And, uh, Lord, we pray for the continued needs that are within our own church family. Yes, and we pray for for Daniel and David who are having transportation difficulties. Yes. Mm -hmm. We pray you would minister to all the different needs that are in Ruth's family among his children and grandchildren. And we Pray for Adela, Lord. We know that she's not functioning at the highest level. Mm -hmm. and that she's struggling and, and weak. We pray that you'd be the Lord who strengthens her and gives her healing grace and mercy. We pray for those who have been a part of us who have not returned yet to us. That you, Lord, will move in their hearts to return to the congregation. Mm -hmm and to worship you with us and to serve you alongside of us. Amen. Yes, Father, we also pray for rain in Washington State mm -hmm. and for weather conditions that would be conducive throughout those western states to uh, putting out these fires. We ask for protection for people and property Comfort for those who have lost property and loved ones, yes. and that you would bring these fires to an end. Thank you, Lord, that your ear is open to the prayers of your people. And we present our thanksgivings and petitions before you today, and pray, Lord, that you would also meet the unspoken request that uh, may be in our hearts and minds by your grace and by your mercy. In Jesus' wonderful Almighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn will be oft, that's short for often, right? Oft in danger, oft in woe.
Corinthians 6, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 13 today as we continue our study in 2 Corinthians. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. The text says, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God who commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We're treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, and as dying and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your heart also. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the scripture today that we've just read. We ask you to guide the preacher that we might be instructed in your word. For Lord, we need the food of your holy word. So feed us and nourish us in your truth. Teach us, Lord, how to live our Christian lives before you. We commit this time with thanksgiving to your blessing. Amen. 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 As we've just read this text today, we can summarize it in three words. It's a message about love, commitment, and self-sacrifice. These character traits were deeply embedded in the Apostle Paul in his service to Christ and his people. And these three words, I believe, are a good summary of the life and ministry of the once zealous Pharisee who turned into a Christian preacher by the grace of God and his life was then crowned and full of love, commitment, and self-sacrifice. 
He loved Jesus Christ supremely, but he also loved Christ's people. Whether they were Jew or Gentile, whether they were slaves or free people, whether they were rich or poor, whether they were educated or uneducated, he was absolutely committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ and serving him in the proclamation of the gospel and in the establishment and maintaining of Christian local churches. The text here begins, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1, Working together with him, then we appeal to you. This is very interesting, but it's entirely consistent with what we've been reading in 2 Corinthians. And uh, even in 1 Corinthians, this idea of Christian servants, workers, laboring together with God. Amen. He's given us a special uh, place, responsibility, uh, to work with him in the work of the gospel here on earth. For example, in Matthew 16, verse 20, we read after the resurrection that they, the disciples, went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. So they went out to preach, but they weren't doing it alone. The Lord, the risen Lord through His Spirit, was working with them. And back in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul said, we are God's fellow workers. You're God's field and God's building. God has given us the privilege of serving Him and serving His church and being participants in the worldwide gospel mission of the church. Amen. Uh, there's a famous book by J.I. Packer called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God and it one of the main things it teaches us there is that God in his sovereignty calls people out of the world and he does it through us, through his servants. As we proclaim the gospel, the Holy Spirit calls people out. So we work together with God. Now Paul says, working together with him, verse 1, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Well, you remember in the previous passage, we, we studied something about Paul making these appeals to the people he was writing to. He was trying to persuade them to believe in Christ, to follow Christ. Uh, in the previous passage, he said, we're ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we saw that Paul was not timid to use persuasion. All of his mental strength and ability and logic and knowledge of Scripture to try to persuade people to come to Christ, to implore them to believe in Christ. Well, evidently though, there were still some people who were lagging behind, who were reluctant, who were not committing themselves to Christ and to his gospel. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up. So there's this exhortation. Yes, it is the sovereignty, the electing purpose of God that calls people to himself, but there's also a responsibility on our part to respond to God. Book of Hebrews says, See that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And then Peter says in 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. So we have a certain responsibility to, to be sure that we believe that we're in the faith and that we're following Christ. You remember that uh, famous passage in uh, Philippians Chapter 2, work out your own salvation. I believe, I believe it's verse 13 and 14. Work out your own salvation, for it's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good purpose. So God works within us, and we work it out with all of our human effort. 
Well, Paul goes on, and he says here, uh, now, for he says, verse 2, in a favorable time I listened to you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Well, what he's doing here is he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8, which has similar words. In a time of favor, I've answered you, and so forth. So, uh, behold, now, the scripture says, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So, Paul is saying, I believe here, that, well, there's this great quote, right, that um, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61. And he goes into his home synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, and they hand him the scroll, and he begins to read from Isaiah 61, which says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord's anointed me to bring good news, to, to heal up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So Jesus is saying, look, the favorable year, the year of Jubilee, the time long awaited has finally arrived through my ministry. It's time to embrace the Messiah, to believe in him, to follow him. Well, now is the favorable time. This Messiah has come, he lived, he died, he rose, he ascended to heaven. Now the message of salvation is being proclaimed throughout the earth, and it's time for men and women to respond. Make no delay. See, the coming of the Messiah into the world was the great sign, the long-awaited sign of Yahweh's favor to the human race. The divine rescue mission had begun, begun in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. So, Paul is saying, now is the day of salvation. Don't delay. Embrace the gospel and commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, he goes on in verse 3. Uh, well, let me make this. Okay, here's the, here's the major, major, first major point I want to bring out in this passage. It's the three major ideas that I see. The first major idea is that Christ must be embraced as Lord and Savior today, immediately. Okay? Uh, sometimes you might, we might hear evangelists saying this. You know, Today's the day of salvation. Well, there's some, a lot of truth in that, you know? Uh, no man knows how long we're going to live. We might have one day, we might have 10 or 20 years. So a person who's not a believer needs to make no delay to run to Christ to, free, to flee from the wrath to come. Now, in verse 3, Paul writes, We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. So Paul is saying here, We are not stumbling blocks in any way to people coming to Christ. On the other hand, we are trying to foster, promote, and encourage people to come to Christ. Uh, Paul says, for example, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll not ever eat meat again. And he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 12, he says, He's talking about the fact that he, as an apostle, had the right to be paid a salary. He had a right, like Peter, to take along a believing wife if he wanted, but he abstained from all these privileges and rights he had in order to be a useful, a more useful minister of Christ, to be entirely devoted. So he was willing to endure all kinds of losses so that he would not be inhibited in his service to Christ. Amen. When he was with the Thessalonians, for example, he said, I didn't eat anybody's bread without paying for it, but I worked day and night so as not to be a burden 
to any of you. And then he goes on and he says, as servants of God, but as servants of God. Well, this is a, a great phrase here, servants of God. Uh, sometimes we might throw that word around a little loosely, but to be a servant of a living God is a tremendous calling, blessing, and responsibility. Amen. Uh, Amen. For example, Solomon, when he began to pray in 2 Chronicles 6.14, King Solomon, he said, O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. So what is a servant of God? Here's a pretty good definition. People who walk before the Lord with all their hearts. Okay? That's a servant of God. Now, another example from the Old Testament. Daniel, chapter 3. If we know anything about Daniel, we know that he was a true servant of God. Uh, and then there were these three men who were living in Babylon, named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And King Nebuchadnezzar commanded everybody in the nation to fall down and worship the golden statue that he was made. But these three Hebrews refused to do it. So the king brought them to the fiery furnace, and he threw them in there. In fact, the soldiers that were throwing him in the fire, they all burned up. The fire was so hot. He heated up, I think, seven times hotter than ever. But the king looks in there and he, say, he said, Behold, I see a fourth man in the fiery furnace, and he is like the Son of God. And so he calls out. He says, the king calls out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And they came out of the fire. So he knew, he called them by the proper name, servants of God. They were loyal to their God. They were faithful to God. And Paul describes himself. He says in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. He puts his servanthood before his apostleship. He was a servant first. And then out of that servanthood, God called him to be apostle. Now, he goes on here in verse 4. And he says, we commend ourselves in every way. What does he mean by commending ourselves? And he begins to list a whole bunch of of ways in which he had served God. Well, if we look at all these ways that he served God, he outlines his lifestyle in the following verses, his suffering, his godly dedicated service that he and his fellow apostles lived out through their ministry. He's not bragging about how he was able to endure all these hardships but he wants them to see, to understand objectively, objectively and clearly the kind of service that they were absolutely committed to under God and for the good of the people among whom they ministered. Now, there were people who were going around trying to tear down the apostle and say negative things about him to undermine the people's confidence in Paul. Paul had to defend himself, and he did from time to time. We commend ourselves in every way. And he gives some examples of his sincere ministry. For example, in the earlier part of this letter, he says in 2 Corinthians 1.12, For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. So this was a way he had been serving among the Corinthians with simplicity and godly sincerity. And he says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper 
with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So the apostle and his fellow, uh, his fellow workers completely threw away, threw aside any kind of cunning, any kind of deceitfulness. They were open. They declared the truth. Their consciences were clear before God and their sincere service before the people. He said, we only want to know one thing among you, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he says, we commend ourselves. We want you to look at our ministry objectively and see the way we've served you. He says, by great endurance and so forth. So the second major point that I want us to see here in this passage today is that Paul and the other apostles' credentials of sacrificial service testified to their genuineness as true ministers of Christ. In other words, Paul says, look at me. What you see is what you get. <laughs> he was open. He was honest. He was faithful. He was true. Well, he says, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance. Well, we know the apostle had great endurance. One time when he was writing to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 4 5, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Distort, discharge all the duties of your ministry. So he was telling Timothy, who he had trained in the faith, to endure hardship. The apostle endured hardship. Another translation says endure suffering. Paul says in another place, share, as he's writing to Timothy, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That scripture has come to me many times over the years mm. when things were tough. Mm. And I was weary. And that scripture would come to my mind. Endure hardness, that is hardship, like a good soldier of Christ. Well, that's what we need. Encouragement from the scriptures to endure when it's not easy. Mm -hmm. He goes on. We commend ourselves not only in endurance, but in afflictions, hardships, calamities, and so forth. Let me just point out, first of all, I want to mention three kinds of hardships are three ways in which he's commending himself as a soldier of Christ, as a warrior in Christ's kingdom. First of all, he talked about his physical hardships. For example, he says in verse 5, beatings, imprisonment. When he went to Philippi in Acts chapter 16, verse 22, we take up the story there, and it says the crowd joined in attacking them, that is the gospel messengers, and the magistrates tore their, tore their garments off with them and gave orders to beat them with rods. So the apostle was being beaten with rods. He says, I was, I was suffering beatings. This wasn't the only time he was beaten with rods. Yeah. And when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. Remember, it was in prison that he and Silas began to sing hymns of praise to God. Their feet were in the stock, ordering, ordering the jail to keep them safe. Well, he says that, uh, again, earlier, when he, he went to, uh, let's see, it's Acts chapter 14, in verse 19, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. He was stoned so bad they thought he was dead. They couldn't hardly detect any breath coming from him. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city. Well, they gathered around him to pray, and Paul revived, and he didn't go the opposite direction. He went back into the city where he'd just been stoned. Talk about courage. 
Paul was a man of great courage and determination. Well, <clears throat> he talks about physical hardships. And then he talks about spiritual maturity in his life. How do we, he said, he, I'm commending myself to you. Look at my life. How do we serve you? By purity. By knowledge. By patience. Think about these things. Think about them in our own lives. Do we have purity? Do we have knowledge? Knowledge of the scriptures. Knowledge of theology. Knowledge of false doctrine that we need to confront. Patience. Kindness. The Holy Spirit. All these things, you see, were ministered in Paul and the apostles and through them, the Holy Spirit. Genuine love is not fake love. It's genuine. Truthful speech. They weren't trying to deceive anyone. They were truthful. And the power of God. What was the secret of their ministry of people being healed? Well, it wasn't human power. It was the power of God. With the weapons, I love this next phrase, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left hand. How do they fight? Weapons of righteousness on the right hand and left hand. Not with physical strength, not with weapons of war, but with weapons of righteousness. Righteousness that comes from the Word of God. And then he commends himself and his fellow apostles through slander and deprivation that they had experienced. In verse 8, he says, through honor and dishonor. We've been honored sometimes, and sometimes we've been dishonored. <laughs> through slander and praise, he'd experienced both. Slander and praise. You ever been slandered? You're not alone. The Apostle Paul was slandered. <laughs> okay. He was slandered, but all other times he was praised. We're treated as impostors, yet we're true. As unknown, yet we're well known. As dying, behold, we live. Apostle Paul came close to death several times. He said earlier in a Corinthian letter, we were just thinking we were going to die. We were in such, such harsh trial. But God came and comforted us. And our hope was in God. And behold, he says, we live. We were close to death, but we're still alive. We're still going on. As punished. Yes, he was beaten with rods, stone, but he wasn't killed. The apostle kept after. He had endurance and determination. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. He experienced sorrow and his own afflictions, his own fears, yet underlying all that was a greater power of rejoicing in the Lord Jesus by the power of his Spirit. As poor, yet making many rich, Apostle worked with his own hands much of his ministry, supporting not only himself but other believers. As having nothing, Maybe the sh cloak on, the, on their back, yet possessing everything. They possessed the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. That's everything. That's the only thing that's going to last, that's worth having, that's certainly worth giving our lives to. Let me give you an example of a modern day servant of Christ who follows a lot of this kind of characteristic of the Apostle Paul. I've been reading his autobiography. His name was Zenos, Zenos N. Morel. He was a Baptist preacher who came to Texas about 1836, or I don't remember the exact year, but he spent 
the rest of his life until he died at about age 80 in Texas helping form Baptist churches and forming associations of churches. Well, he experienced many hardships. I could tell you many, but I don't have time. Attacks from hostile Indians, from the Mexican army, and so forth. His own son was captured in a battle and taken to a Mexican prison for two years. His wife was in such grievous condition over that that she died. He believes that was the cause of her death. He had another daughter that died. So he came to Texas because he felt God called him to come here and establish religion in this republic. He's talking about the Christian religion, right? And then when things began to settle down, a great host of settlers came <clears throat> from the east. And he knew that churches needed to be established for these people. So he labored long and hard in the cause of the gospel here in Texas. I remember reading uh, just the other day that he was serving three small congregations there in central Texas. And he had to go, I think it was to Houston for some reason. And these were small churches. And so the only support he had was from the churches. And so he had to go on this errand. He didn't have any money to pay the ferryman. So he decided not to say anything to anybody. <laughs> he just went. Because before the ferryman had a le let, let him go across free. But when he got there, and he didn't have any money, the ferryman, as they call him, the one who operated the ferry, got mad. Mm. And so Zenos gave him his coat. Mm. Gave him his coat and said, I'll pay you the rest that I owe you when I come back this way. So he went on to his destination, and there a brother in Christ gave him the money that he needed to get back across the river uh, and return to his home. But this is just an example. He was in a penniless condition. He lost his crops uh, six or seven years in a row. Uh, he worked hard to plant corn, and he lost it all for one reason or another. So these kinds of servants the Lord Jesus Christ followed in the train of the Apostle Paul throughout church history mm -hmm. and up to the present time. Well, uh, Paul goes on here. So he, he outlines, he commends, he commends his ministry and that of the fellow apostles as being a dedicated ministry of love commitment, and service as a warrior for the kingdom of God. And then he goes on in this last section, verses 11 through 13, and he says to the Corinthians, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You're not restricted by us, but you're restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children widen your hearts. So the, the third major idea that I want us to see here today is that some of these Corinthians needed to open up their hearts in response to Paul and his fellow servants in their love and sacrifice for them. It was like a one-sided show here. The apostle... <laughs> And his fellow servants were doing all the work and love and self-sacrifice. Yeah. And some of those folks were not responding. Why would they be holding back their affection to the Apostle Paul? Well, it could be. The major reason is they were holding it back from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They hadn't committed themselves to Christ. So they didn't commit themselves to an active relationship with the apostle. Or maybe they, they had come to Christ, but they hadn't grown enough spiritually to recognize the privilege and responsibility that we have to love and support our brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul was a, 
a mighty apostle and preacher and defender of the faith, but he was a man of love. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, writing to the Thessalonian church, we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Being so affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the kind of man the apostle was. He was a loving man who treasured these people in his heart. Mm -hmm. Well, the Corinthians needed to open wide, some of them, their closed hearts to the hard-working apostles' love for them. They might have said to these Corinthians, we've given up everything for you. We've done everything we could for your spiritual good. O Corinthians, therefore, open up the affection of your hearts to us also. So what have we seen today? First of all, the apostle is exhorting some of the people there in Corinth to embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today immediately. Don't delay. Don't hold back. And secondly, Paul and his fellow apostles' credentials, qualifications, in other words, of sacrificial service testified to their genuineness as true ministers of Christ. And then thirdly, he exhorts those reluctant Corinthians who needed to, to open up their hearts in response to Paul and his fellow servants' love and sacrifice on their behalf. Respond in like manner. So Paul appeals to certain people in Corinth not to receive the grace of God in vain, but to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as they open wide their hearts to Paul and the other apostles whose strenuous ministries validated their unreserved commitment to Jesus Christ and his church. Well, let me draw a few conclusions from this passage today. First of all, let us be thankful for the grace of God that worked so wonderfully and powerfully in the apostles and in the lives of other God-called men throughout Christian history, such as Brother Zenos Morel here in Texas, who faithfully delivered the gospel message in spite of intense hardship and even persecution. You see, our faith is built not only on the suffering and blood and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but our faith has been declared and preserved by men who paid a heavy price with their own sweat and blood down through the ages. Secondly, we must seek to follow the examples of these self-sacrificing and godly apostles in our own lives, our own ministries today, as we share the gospel with other people, as we proclaim the gospel, as we minister to others in Jesus' name. The apostle told Timothy one time, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So, where in ever the Apostle Paul was following Jesus Christ, we need to follow Paul. <laughs> whatever he did, whatever attitudes he had, we need to follow him because he's leading us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thirdly, think about the three words that I used at the beginning here to describe the life 
of Paul the Apostle. Love, commitment, and self-sacrifice. Our service to Christ must be a labor of love to him and to his people, the church. We must be absolutely committed to the Lord Jesus Christ to serve him and by his grace to do his will in our own lives. We must be willing to put our lives on the altar of self-sacrifice, not carrying the personal cost to ourselves, but giving up all things, taking up our cross, and following Jesus in whatever he might have us to do to pour out our lives for his glory on the earth. The Apostle Paul and his companions were true warriors, soldiers for Christ. They used spiritual weapons, purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, and so forth. They were heroic soldiers, unselfish soldiers, loving soldiers. You see, it's not an option. Our Christian lives. We've been called to live a life of self-sacrifice. It's not an option for us to imitate whether we want to follow, follow the Apostles' example or not. The Scriptures call us to do that. This is our calling today, in 2020. To follow the Apostle Paul in his life of love and self-sacrifice and commitment as he followed Christ. These are our marching orders. So let's pursue the will of God wholeheartedly and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. There was once an Anglican missionary who served God in the late 1700s and early 1800s, named Henry Martin. He translated, he went to Asia. He translated the New Testament into Urdu, one of the major languages there in Asia and Persian language. And he once said, famous words, let me burn out for God. He died at age 31 on the foreign field. He, he got sick. Well, we should not foolishly endanger our own health, but we should offer up our lives as a living flame of light for the Lord Jesus Christ to be used in his service as he may see fit for each of our lives. So let's go forth to pursue the will of God for each of our lives, remembering that Jesus gave up his life for us. He despised the shame of the cross for the joy of set before him. So let us endure hardship as good soldiers of Christ, as fellow warriors with Paul and the other apostles. We only have one life to live. We don't know how long it will be, but let's make the best of it for Christ's glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, how blessed we are to read about the service of the Apostle Paul, his love, his commitment, his dedication. What marvelous and great things you do in the life of a human being to transform us, to conform us into the image of Christ, the supreme servant of you, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, thank you for these men who gave up their lives to establish the gospel to found churches. And throughout history, Lord, we find similar men of dedication and service. And we pray that in our own day, we might follow in this train and be men and women who are dedicated to a ministry of love, commitment, and service to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our response hymn today will be on our worship guide, Preachers of the God of Grace.
desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And in John 13, 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we who come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can only come because of his great love for us. For although we are completely undeserving of his love, yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to everlasting life as God's sons and daughters, our Savior Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. In remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, He's instituted this holy sacrament, which we're now about to share. But those who would eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and come with a penitent heart and steadfast faith. And above all, we must give thanks to God for his love toward us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let them give thanks to the Lord our God. It is it's right to give our thanks and praise. Eternal God, holy and mighty, it's truly right in our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. You laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure. You're always the same and your years will never end. You made us in your image and called us to be your people, but we turned from you, leaving sin and death to reign. Still you loved us and sought us, and in Christ your grace defeated death and opened the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the heavenly choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place 
who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, healed those who believed in him, received all who sought him, and lifted the burden of their sin. We glorify you for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new people by water and the Spirit. Great is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ ascended, Christ will come again. Now we sing our communion hymn of coming to Christ.
The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Take, eat, and feed upon Christ in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in blood, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. The cup we take is a sharing in the body, the body of Christ. Christ. Take and drink. as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the first two stanzas of Now Let Us From This Table Rise, Renewed in Body, Mind, and Soul. crucified and risen Savior, for it is in his name that we pray, and in his name that we glory, now and evermore. Amen. Our closing hymn of going out, stand up, stand up.
Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. And now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. Amen.